Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Insider, brought to you, just for a change, by Vanishing Inc. My guest today needs absolutely no introduction. I'm honoured to have Mr John Carney on the show. John, how are you this afternoon? Uh, very fine, thank you so much. It's a short show, John, 30 minutes, there's no time for pleasantries. What's your magic origin story? You've got 48 <laughs> seconds. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a cousin that showed me a very simple card trick with a key card, and and then they put them in my hand, and you slap them, and that's the only one left, which is actually still a very, very good trick. And uh, then some other kid had a coin slide, and and eventually I started buying props. Then I got into sleight of hand, and I started selling off all the props and buying lots of books. And that's kind of where I've stayed uh, most of my life. Uh, I do work with some apparatus, but uh, I, I was firmly established as a sleight of hand guy when I first got uh, Divern one of Divern's first books. Okay, so what age was the, the slap key card thing? And what age was the I want to do sleight of hand? Uh, about 12 years old was probably like when I saw the card trick and the, and the other thing. And... Uh, and uh, you know, it got more serious uh, uh, in, the, in the years after that. Probably around 15 years old, I was pretty set okay. in my okay. ways. Yeah. Let's let's talk magic books. Um, we'll get to your new book later. But I understand you've got quite a high regard for books that some people might regard as outdated, like um, modern magic or. Oh, there it is. Sacks sleight of hand. What do you think their relevance is today? Uh, I think, you know, I, I'm a, a not a fan of the uh, consumer culture in magic where everything is about the latest thing. What's new? Mm -hmm. What's new? And then you buy a trick and you do a trick or you read a trick and you do a trick. And, and what I look for in, in books are principles and premises, you know, and, and I may not even be wanting to do that particular routine or that method or or anything i'll just say oh there's a trick with a golf club and a thing i never thought about that you know right and then you then i start thinking about that and then maybe i'll research lots of different things and it doesn't mean that i'll do it exactly out of that book but if you read these old books you have a much bigger foundation and you can call upon many more ideas when you're trying to create things or when you're trying to structure things or, or design uh, a routine. And uh, it just gives you a bigger base of information. You don't have to read every single word in the book, you know, mm -hmm. skim it, learn some principles. If something's interesting to you, then read the whole thing. And even if you're learning a routine, I would say, uh, learn like the basics of it, get off book and work on it. Uh, get, one of the first things is get off book, get off book, and then go back for details. But you got to go back for details. But the idea is to get the concept of what you're doing. If you know what you're trying to accomplish, like in a pass, one half is going around the other. Sure. If you start reading, you're going to get a little confused and you go, well, what's really going on? Oh, this is, you know. But if you get the idea that one is exchanging the other, now you can go back and say, where does this finger go? How, how firmly do you press? How high? How low? All those sort of things. But the, the old books are inspiration, and they're also like encyclopedias of principles and ideas. And uh, they're not as fun and not as easy because you hmm. do have to concentrate. And we all have a shorter attention span with a video age and, and all that sort of thing. And I, I, I'm no different. Uh, I really have to want to learn something to, to read it out of a book. I have to, you know, it's not just some small variation or something. I want to, it has to be something I really want to learn. But it's so important to know more than what exists on video because that's very limited what's what's only on video. Um, John, I understand that even though you're right-handed, you perform some slights as if you were left-handed. What's your thinking behind that? Well, when I first started learning magic, I'd read things in a book, and it would say, hold the deck in the left hand. And the left hand 
really doesn't do that much. It may be you know, hold a break or something, but mm -hmm. uh, my strong hand is is my strong hand is the right hand. And what I'm saying is that that bottom hand does most of the work. If you're doing a pass, this does ah, all the work. If you're doing steel. a side steal, yeah, it's yeah. this, a peak, you're holding a break mm -hmm. down here, all those things and dealing, pushing off and pulling back and bottom dealing and and second dealing, all those things are with this bottom hand. This hand's kind of passive. So when I put the deck over there, I felt weak. I felt weak. And that, that was early on when I was just 14 years old or something that I, I discovered. I said, I'm just going to switch it to the other hand. So now, uh, anytime over the, you know my whole lifetime when I've had to learn a move, I have to automatically, when I read right, I go right, left. That means left, 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 right. I'm switching constantly. And that's what I mean by learn the concept, what you're trying to accomplish, because if you know what's going to happen, that right and left hand won't confuse you in the description because you know what you're trying to accomplish. And you go, oh, well, this finger, not necessarily right or left, but this finger is what holds it or didn't, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but it's my stronger hand. How interesting. I'd never, yeah, I'm, my right hand's dominant as well, and I'd never even thought about that. It makes perfect sense. You use both hands, so sure. what, what makes it right or left handed when you're yeah, using yeah. both hands? So yeah, absolutely. I just went to my strong hand that did the most work. Uh, you've got a high regard for a Scottish grocer called John Ramsey. Um, uh -huh. Why is that? <laughs> John Ramsey. Uh, he was a master of misdirection, and another thing is I, I just appreciate the fact that he was an, basically an amateur magician, Yeah. but he still cared enough. So it drives me crazy when people say, oh, well, I don't do it for a living. I'm just having fun. I just, you know, I don't, you know. But if, you go, if you're going out there and performing things, you're making magic look bad if you're not practicing and you're not putting some thought into it. It's not just practice. It's applied thought. And Ramsey did that in spades. He, 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 he took old tricks and he, he put new thinking to them, his own personal thinking to them. And studying uh, Andrew Galloway's books, I don't try to imitate Ramsey. I try to get the idea, the concepts. And basically, there's just two things that Ramsey said. If you want somebody to look mm -hmm. at something, look at it yourself. If you want somebody to look at you, look at them. And that looking at something yourself gets people to focus on something. You don't know where they're looking. So you want them to know where they're looking. Now you know they're looking here because you're making this look important and relevant. And they're going, oh, something important. And then when you relax, when you're, you physically, uh, visibly relax and look at them, it's very easy to get them to look at you. But you, if you time it right, you do it right before, if you're doing a move or something, right as you approach it, right about here, you look up, and there's your window. Your window is right. gone. So if you're trying to misdirect people and you have a pass, you're trying to do a pass, mm -hmm. and you're going, so, uh, where are you from? Where are you from? <laughs> you know, your window is that. That's your window. Just when your hands come together for a second to square or to put it down or whatever. But that Ramsey idea, I apply it to every single thing I do. Every card move, every coin move, thimble move, everything. And uh, any, anything that you're trying to misdirect away from and de-emphasize. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you knew Charlie Miller and saw him perform. What, what, can, what stands out in your memories about him? What can you tell me about him? <laughs> Well, Charlie is a really eccentric fellow, a really, really charming and sweet eccentric fellow, kind of a man-child in a way, and I don't mean that as an insult at all, but he was, he was kind of naive, I think, when he was raised. He, he, you know, he didn't have a father. He was kind of sheltered with a Victorian sort of mother. And, uh, but he, when he got into magic, he found his niche, and he practiced and practiced and practiced obsessively. And that's why he became so fantastically good. But he hid his light under a bushel, and uh, he was always in the shadow of Divernon. And Divernon mm -hmm. published more things. So every, you know, and Charlie was younger than Vernon, so Charlie looked up to Vernon. And uh, so you don't see people talking about Charlie the same way they talk about Vernon. But he's definitely at that at that level, um, and. Uh, 
he was a he was a sweetheart of a guy. And my friend Fawcett Ross introduced me to Charlie Miller, and uh, Charlie sort of studied under Fawcett Ross for stage magic because Charlie could do close up and cards. Uh, but when he tried to get gigs, you know, they said, "Well, can you do a stage act?" No, I don't right. have a stage act. So, so Fawcett helped him uh, construct a stage act and gave him lots of great advice, practical, how to be practical when you're on stage. And and the, you know, not not just Charlie. I was just talking about this with Charlie every day. Uh, I, Charlie the other day with somebody this idea of simplifying things trying okay. to simplify things and charlie took everything that made it the most simple like i had a a coin through the hand you know the, mm -hmm. the stack of quarters right mm -hmm. and i would go through the hand and then you have the gimmick you have the gimmick sure. over here the, the the solid stack or whatever and i was trying to think i was a teenager and i'm trying to think whoa i'll sleeve it or i'll top it it or i'll mm -hmm. leave a button open i'll throw it between the buttons i'll lap it i'll you know, do something c crazy. And Charlie said, no, no, no. The coins fall through. You've got it palmed here. You just pick up the coins and put them all together and put them in your pocket. <laughs> and I was trying to do all these complicated things. So, you know, whereas a lot of guys would say, oh, it's not clean because you don't end clean. Well, if people think there's something in your hand, you did something wrong long before that moment. That's true. So, so the idea is to make things simple and practical for as many situations as you can encounter. So you're always at your best. If you have some angly thing and you have to sit this or move over there so I can do my trick, you're not going to be able to do your favorite material. So uh, simplifying. And Charlie was was uh, uh, supreme at that. All the effects are very direct. There's no confusing countdown, spelling, and all that kind of thing. You know, I like the kind of trick where you pull them out of their ear. You pull the card out of their ear. You know, visual magic. And, and Charlie did very straightforward magic. No no fooling around. So it's not just the, the Vernon thing about simplicity of plot and clarity of effect, but simplicity of method as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the effect, too, because a lot of times if you someone shows you a trick and you ask them what the effect is, they'll say, well, I, you know, I dealt down 24, and then you know, I spelled this thing, and then, you know, and, yeah. The average person, they go, well, um, he got the card. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, he located, he got the right card. But, you know, what, what happened to it? What, what was the plot? You know, it's more fun when people can follow it. It's like watching a movie and they throw in extra characters that don't mean anything. And you go, well, yeah. what was that guy? Or, what, you know, what was that all about? Why, why does that have to do? It's more fun when it just flows and you understand what's going on and um, identify with the characters. And, that, and that's more about getting, you know, not it being about this, but this yeah, yeah communicating with people and and relating to people in a conversation i saw some uh videos of fred caps on youtube and i love fred caps he was i still is probably the best all-around magician ever stage mm -hmm. close up he had great Everything. taste he had yeah, great yeah. technique he, he you know he create he didn't create a lot of new magic but he but he routined it, you know, it's creative routining and, and that sort of thing. And then I'd read the comments below and you could tell it was like some young kids that were doing it on their phone or something because there's no punctuation and no, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it just said, I'm bored. He's talking too much. Get into the magic. And it's like, <laughs> it's all about communicating with people. It's not just about your hands. And on, on YouTube, you can tell that because... They cut themselves off. It's yep. not their. It's their heads cut off, and it's their Crunch hand shot. here. <laughs> yeah, and it's crotch magic theater, you know. <laughs> and you know, but if you can get people, if you can relate to people, they they're gonna like you, and they're gonna like the magic more because you're talking to them, not at them. Yeah. And it's also better misdirection. They're not focused on your hands because you're talking to them, so. and then when you do a move, nobody's looking at nobody's looking at your hands. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it, there's more to it, you know. It's a performing art. It's a, it's not an just an exhibition. There's a big <laughs> difference between a performance and an exhibition, and uh, I try to do a performance and and actually relate to people. And uh, Di Vernon 
people never talk about this, but one of the aspects that I I learned from watching him was he would just engage you in conversation, and you never knew when the trick started. Yeah. And he was an interesting guy, and it didn't sound like rehearsed patter or, you know, it sounded like, hey, it's this old guy he has an interesting interesting uh life and oh he knows about that oh have you ever wondered about this or that and you you're kind of yeah, you see the it. dates the, the thing about the story about the the date on the on the on the on the coin before he vanished it and talking just talking about the date rather than going into a trick yeah well, anything, know, anything, anything? I mean? yeah well i mean if it's relevant the date i don't know i don't know what in particular you're referring to but but yeah anything about that you could say oh this coin is oh 1917 oh that's in the past or something you know but if you have some relevant patter point or something to to point that out but people relate to other people more than they relate to things and yeah. it's fun to watch the gymnastics and the and the magic but really what they go home remembering is a little story or and and they remember you if they liked you or not you know and if they like yeah. you and you're polite and you're considerate you're not obnoxious they're going to like it even if you don't do a very good magic trick you're you're st <laughs> they're still going to like you and that and that's more important than anything just to just to relate to people sure uh, you mentioned uh Fawcett and he was clearly a huge part in your magical development for any younger listeners can you say who he was and why he was so influential to you well he was mostly uh influential because he was he was really accessible to me he was close by mm. he was one of di vernon's uh best friends and knew ross bertram very well all the old timers when he was a young man like when i was a young man he used to uh, drive to see uh, T. Nelson Downs. Uh. And then here I was driving to see Fawcett Ross, who was about three hours away. And Fawcett was not wildly original, but he was really great at routining things, taking three separate tricks and somehow routining them together. And then he also kind of categorized them as things you could do with people on stage and without people on stage. And... He had he had different shows for you know uh, Cub Scouts and then he had another show for a nightclub crowd and another for, for an outdoor thing because now there's wind and all the thing. So he I mean he thought through all these things, and he was a pro and that that is, the, and uh, he he cared about you know what he did and he didn't just pick up a check and buy a bunch of equipment and do it. You know he worked through it and details and. And, uh, and he was a, a, a really terrific guy. He was a really, really sweet man. He introduced me to a lot of great magicians and very encouraging and very, very helpful. And uh, I wouldn't say I learned a lot of technique from him, but I got a lot of great advice and, and he was a great friend. And obviously you mentioned Vernon. Um, you spent a lot of time with the professor and he wrote about you. It's amazing how talented some of these younger chaps are and the skill they have attained at such a tender age. That must have made you feel really good. Uh, I don't know. Is he referring to me? But, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's like the, you, can't, you, know, you can't look at the stuff that's coming out today in books or videos or anything and say, oh, we're so great because we're modern and we're the... That stuff came from somewhere. Everything is based on something else. Nothing new under the sun, as the bard would say. Mm. And uh, we, you build on things. It's a, it's a, there's principles, and then you can expand on those ideas and variations on those things. And everything you see today has been invented before, but in another form, or they're fresh combinations of things and uh so well i, I think i said it there <laughs> <laughs> what what was what was it like to sit down with vernon what what was he like as a friend um you know it, for the first when i moved out here for the first couple of years he he knew who i was because i was a friend of Fawcett's. but you know mm -hmm. we weren't like super close right away you, you have to earn people's respect and their trust sure. and and uh and maybe they don't want to be your friend, you know? It's like, you know, you don't force yourself on people. 
But if you're polite and considerate and you're earnest and you, you have a similar interest, gradually it kind of develops. You, do, you don't push it. And that's kind of what I did. You know, he'd see me around the castle and he'd say, oh, that kid has a couple nice ideas. And then he'd go, what do you, what is it? John, John, okay, John. Now he knows me. Now I'm sitting across the couch from him. And mm -hmm. they weren't formal lessons. But at the castle, he had a couch, yes, a little love seat, and right across that was another love seat, and I'd plop myself down there along with everybody else that had the opportunity, and I'd just sit there and we'd chat, and I'd show him a trick, and he'd say, "That's no good. That's no good. Here, try it this way, or well, why don't you think about that?" And and uh, he he taught me in an interesting way. He never discouraged me. He would say things like, "Johnny, I'm surprised at you." Oh. You're a very clever young man. Now, why would you do it that way? Think about it. And I would go home, and I'd think about it, and I'd come back, and I'd go, I figured it out. And he'd go, no, you didn't. No, nope, still stinks. You know, still, you know, he wouldn't say stinks, but he would say, yeah, you still haven't got it. And I'd go back and back and back and back. And finally, the ultimate compliment is he goes, yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like, oh, you're fabulous. Oh, you're fantastic. He'd go, yeah, okay, that's the idea, okay. And I would show him things, and I would stimulate him, and he'd go home. He says, Johnny, I was thinking about what you showed me there. So so he still loved magic, and he still thought about it to the very end. You know, he loved working on things. And um, uh, it, it wasn't a formal lesson kind of a situation. It was, they were conversations. I was lucky to be in the same room with him many times, and we just had a lot of conversation. We're two people that love magic. Sure. And he could tell, he, he would never discourage people unless he could tell that they were looking for a shortcut. You know, what's, what's uh, the brand of cards that I'm going to use that's going to make me a better magician? Or, you know, how, how, what do you, what's the hand cream you, no, no, no. It's like, if you're not, you're not thinking about magic if those are your main questions, you know. You, you, but if you come in and you go, now when I do this, it kind of, it kind of catches on the thing. How? Why do you suppose that? You know, maybe he'll help you with that because now you've already done the groundwork. You right. don't walk up to Di Vernon and say, "How do I palm a coin?" <laughs> you know, he gives. He's more of a finesse guy. He gives you finesse. Sure. You have to do some study. You have to come in with something, and if he recognizes that, uh, he he would he would he would tell you anything. He'd talk about anything. But if you you were not earnest and you didn't work at things, then he'd tell get out of magic. <laughs> he just, he didn't want to hear it. I, I remember some years ago at the International Magic Convention uh, in London seeing you do Mr. Misto. Uh, where, where did Mr. Misto come from, John? <laughs> uh, deep psychological wounds. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Uh, well, you know, I... Probably before I even wanted to do magic, I wanted to do uh, comic acting, like I saw in uh, Dick Van Dyke or Tim Conway or Jonathan Winters or, you know, a lot of my heroes like that, even W.C. Fields. You know, they're characters. It's character-based comedy as opposed to stand-up jokes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. behaving as opposed to, you know, saying clever, clever things. You know, I'd like to yeah. be as clever as I can. But anyway, so I like characters and david williamson had was doing a thing called midnight madness at a convention in washington dc and he said he saw me do a card routine and all i did in the routine that's I, ha I had a hat on because i was spinning cards into the hat and cards are floating and crawling out of the hat and then at one point i put the hat on and i did a funny bow like this and david goes that's a great character we should interview him and i go character i haven't got a character <laughs> so he said well we're gonna do it and so uh, we had just a, a, a four weeks, five weeks time, and I go, oh my God, I, I can't go up there without anything in my head. I got to come up with something, and I started thinking in about these weeks. characters. Yeah, well, basically, you know, something like that. I had had improv training, so right, and and acting training. So you know, I've been doing characters and voices my whole life, but I really didn't do them on stage, really. And so I started thinking, well, who could this guy be? What does he sound like? Does he sound like Harry Blackstone? <laughs> or does, is he kind of a mealy guy? Or is he this or that? And, you know, try, does he have a mustache? Does he have this? You know, I'm thinking about all these things. And right up till, right up till showtime, I was mixing them around and trying to figure out who, what, what I was going to do. 
But once you go on stage, one of the things I learned about in, in improv, once you go on stage, you have to commit. Mm-hmm. And you can't break character. That's not, you know. So once I committed to one character or the other, that's what he was. And it went over so well that I decided to keep keep doing it. And, uh, you know, I wrote a little backstory for him. He had all this crazy history. And, and he's based on a lot of characters that I've seen. Uh, like uh, oh, Ernie Kovacs had a character. And uh, there's a little bit of Charlie Miller in there. Dom DeLuise, the actor Dom DeLuise. Uh, Carl Ballantyne. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of all those guys. It's kind of an amalgam. And uh, anyway, it, it gave me an opportunity to do a character on stage. And the magic... I think people look at him and go, well, he's obviously an idiot, which is really fun because underneath I'm doing moves and I'm slow, mm-hmm. uh, I'm loading things and switching things and doing all these things. And nobody thinks anything of it because they, 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 they don't think, oh, he's a clever guy. They go, oh, he's an idiot, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 sure. You can get away with a lot, a lot of stuff. And it's, and it's fun. It's fun to be somebody else and, and, uh, and, and be a little broader because I'm a, I'm a little bit more low-key in my everyday life and even in my performing style so it's nice to be able to mix it up with uh characters and and since then i've had developed several different characters that i do on stage you got a new book out john haven't you slights and insights yes i have now it's been a long long way coming it has and it's a very eclectic collection covering close-up coin card tricks through to the great Leon's haunted doll's house. Mm. But I'd say if there was one unifying theme in the book, it's that it's your philosophy, your thoughts on how magic should be developed and performed. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. um, I I like all kinds of magic. Uh, You know, I started out with sleight of hand and then gradually I started picking up a people piece of simple piece of apparatus and working out you know more stage stage routines and whatnot and so i don't say i'm a card guy i'm a coin guy this kind you know i just like all magic you know there's things i don't like i don't like things that are tricky and have really obvious props or anything but the idea behind the book was i you know i don't like books of theory where they just sit back with a pipe and they go well my theory about (laughs) magic is this or that because it's it's fun to read, but it really doesn't get you anywhere because you don't have an example to, well, what do you mean by that? Or I think I know. And then they'll go on the Internet and say, talk about our art, and they sound like really thoughtful. Uh, but they really, it's really, a lot of it is kind of empty or they don't understand what they're saying. So my the, the idea behind this book, whether people get the idea or not, is to talk about principles and ideas. Now, principles of magic, principles of how to practice, how to create, how to do characters, uh, how to routine things, uh, how to recognize weaknesses and correct the weaknesses and all those sort of things. And I absolutely repeat those throughout the book, different ideas, because I'm trying to drive it home. You hear it once, you're not gonna remember it. So keep driving home. Here's another example of that, what I was talking about. So I'm using these tricks as examples uh, to illustrate principles and ideas. And I'm definitely, the whole time, trying to encourage uh, anyone that's reading it to do these things for themselves. Because sure. you automatically think, you know, if you look, look at the, the Beatles of Paul McCartney, you go, well, I couldn't. I couldn't write a song, or I couldn't play the guitar, or this or that. Well, uh, Paul McCartney would say the same thing when he was younger. I didn't know how to do it. I just started doing it. Mm. I just started doing it, and I learned as I go. And I, you know, I, I, I developed things. I kept trying. You know, I write a million songs, and uh, maybe, you know, 500 of them turn out to be great. You know, most people maybe one, but him, you know, <laughs> yeah, three, 500 songs. And he's, uh, he's an anomaly. But <clears throat> to encourage people and... And get them to care about their magic for crying out loud when people just say it's good enough. That makes me insane. And so many things are easy to correct. Right. Good sleight of hand is not necessarily harder. It means you've thought about it more. You've thought about the details. You've thought about the spaces in between. You've thought about how you get into it, how you get out of it. 
you think, well, how, what trick comes next? You blend things together. How do you cover this? How do you misdirect this? What do I say? Mm -hmm. All these things are important, but when you just go out and you buy a trick and then you show the trick the next day or you learn a trick and you show it the next day, you're not done. That's just the beginning. Learning the trick, getting off book, that's step one. And then from then on, you just keep trying to improve it. And sometimes I'm still thinking about things that I've done many, 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 many years, and I'm thinking about them again. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of things just develop over time. So you can't expect to be an instant magician, even if you're skillful, maybe, and, and knowledgeable. You still have to think about things. And I do this with all my friends that I think are knowledgeable magicians, uh, what David Williamson and Charlie Fry and, uh, you know, all my friends. You know, we're always going, geez, I, I just can't come up with that last little thing that's going to make this work. Or, you know, how do I misdirect that? Or what do I say for the? All these things are so important. And when you combine them all, that gives you the confidence when you get in front of people because you're not trying to think of what comes next with the moves or what you're going to say or any of those things. You know, if you care about it, it's the difference between love and lust. <laughs> like just a, just getting an immediate gratification right. or really nurturing a, a love affair and a really caring about something and really doing the work. Doing yeah, yeah. the work is the whole point. Yeah. Um, the wand rising from the bottle is an ancient trick and sometimes taught in kids' magic books, but you've covered it in your new book. What made you choose to include it? Well, it was part of that haunted, uh, uh, haunted routine, and uh, it was—it's kind of a new, new technology for that particular trick because you you take a wand, you put it, they can examine it, you put it in the bottle, it jumps up and rises up and down, it rises up and down, and then it jumps out of the bottle, and you hand them the bottle, you hand them the wand. So that's not like any of the ones from the kids' magic books. You can't, <laughs> Indeed, you no. Can't, I mean, you can't uh, not the not the method anyway. But again. I was looking for a premise. I go, I always like that premise. Yeah. And uh, and I played with it, but I never really did it. And then I go, geez, that would make that would be great in this routine if at one point I just put that in the bottle and, you know, that then the, it gives the uh, wand uh, some significance. You don't sure. just bring out a stick and start tapping things. It comes to life. It sticks to your hand. That's the other routine uh -huh. in there is where the, it sticks to your hand, but not in the conventional ways that people know uh, or combining methods or whatever and uh yeah just looking for you know cleaner ways to do things and um uh but simple simple simplifying things and it's actually harder to simplify things than to do things the the complicated way uh, uh the hacks the beginners they don't make as many mistakes as the pros because the pros are constantly trying to figure out what what the you know they're trying new things and they're rejecting things and trying other things and the hacks and the beginners they always know the easy way they never ever know the simple way because okay. simple is not the same as easy it's not okay. the same as easy if you if you say if you say simple is the same as easy you'll have a trick deck of cards mm -hmm. and you'll do one trick and then somebody wants to examine it. Well, they can't. Or they want to shuffle it. They can't. Uh, the, you know, you can't, oh, you can't do any game other over. tricks with it because it's a, yeah, game's over, right? And you go, but it's the easy way. Well, if you want to do that correctly, now you're going to have to switch the deck or you're going to have to have some other steps in there that are going to complicate things. Whereas... If you, you know, learn to do, you know, you could do it with a short card. I don't care if it's, you know, doing a pass or anything. The simple, most direct way. Sometimes it's very difficult, and sometimes it's dead easy as far as execution goes. But the thinking is the difficult part. You have to concentrate. You have to focus on things, focus on a problem, and uh, go with the most practical for the most situations. Like ditching the coin stack as you pick up the coins when you're doing the, the quarters through the hand thing. Yeah. So how does somebody, how does somebody learn to begin to do, to, to work out that simple solution? Are there practical steps that people can take? I don't know if there's any formula for that, you know, but if you start performing a few times and you don't know 
which pocket that's in or or this this flashes when people over here are starting to look or right you just take into consideration all those things and you go I can't do this this way because it's gonna it's gonna get me in trouble or I'm mm-hmm. gonna flash or it's gonna be you know it's not uh, so you start thinking about how to simplify it you trying to get rid of as many variables as possible if you limit the variables there's fewer things that can go wrong. Right. And that's what I'm looking for. You know, I'm not going to lose the card because I did some obscure card location where it's I have to learn a formula and three f- in pharaohs and all that kind of stuff <laughs> because you you might lose it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I learned from reading uh, a Leipzig's book, they said he would never take a chance on things. He wouldn't classic force a card. I bet I could classic force a card probably i don't do it I'll, hardly ever anymore but i bet i could do it 80 percent of the time that's not good enough right. that's not good enough if i'm on stage i have a planned act or i'm doing a show and i have a planned act and a, a routine this leads into this this leads into this if i miss that card that trick stinks and now i've already lost the link to the thing mm-hmm. that follows it so i've got to get that card Force. So I use a very surefire force, like a dribble force, which I describe in the book as well. And all my methods are very, very straightforward. They may not be physically easy, but they're very simple. I'm surefire. Yeah, as far, as much as I can get them. I, you know, some of them, uh, you know, if if it's not surefire, I'm probably it's probably not in my act yet. Right. It's but you know maybe I'm fooling with it, but it's not in my act yet. But I'd say after about 50 performances, it's pretty well set. I'm not going to change too much. And after 100 performances in front of real people, I feel like, okay, this is, this is an established routine now. I can, yeah. I, can, I, can get it, I, can, I can entertain people, and it's practical. And, and, uh, but it takes that much to figure out all the things that could possibly go wrong. To figure them out or for them to go wrong? <laughs> oh well. You, at the same time, you're you're you know as you're performing it, you go well. This could happen, and you you make allowances for that. And then other times, it happens, and you make allowances for that. So you're thinking about it, and you're experiencing it, and you're making adjustments. You're not just doing things the same way. The definition of insanity is doing things the same way over and over and over, and expecting a different result. Yeah. You know, if you change your your uh, your procedure you're going to change the result you talk a lot about creating the theatrical illusion of magic how how do you do that well that that's you know that's kind of a i don't know that i do that absolutely every time because i'm not like a david blaine miracle man i mean Uh there's a there's a whole group of people like on YouTube and whatever, and they, they really want people to believe that they're a mystery man and they're, they're like have otherworldly powers. And, you know, I don't, I don't expect people to, you know. But I don't want any evidence of sleight of hand. I want it to be a mystery. I want it to, you know, tell a little story. But hiding your skill. Get, hiding skill. I, I, spend, I spend half my time acquiring the skill, the other half learning how to cover it up so it doesn't look like sleight of hand. And if if somebody says oh, that oh boy your hands are fast I I've lost right that's that's not that's not a win for me uh, because I I want them to go geez he didn't do anything yeah you know even though I'm doing a lot of things they don't see I want them to go <laughs> he didn't th- he didn't appear to do anything it's just how in the world could you so now they're thinking trick cards and they examine the cards there's nothing and they think the thread and they go there's no thread and then they get you know. But sleight of hand should be only one of the things that they consider, not the only. As soon as I start doing this for everything, they go, sleight of hand. Oh, mm-hmm. that's how he did it. He flicked them. I hear people <laughs> say that, laymen say that all the time. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know how he did it. He, he, like, flicked them, and it went, you know, and it changed. Well, that doesn't explain anything. But <laughs> it if does you to see them. <laughs> something, if you see some something, you know, if I do a pass, and it's invisible, and you go, uh-huh. Why why are my hands like that? That's so cozy and it's so suspicious and you don't know the, you don't need to know the details of what what's happening. If it looks like a move, 
That's the secret. They don't need to know where the fingers go and that it's called a pass or anything like that. If you do anything suspicious, that's bad. That's no longer the illusion of magic. And and I, I just try to, you know, it's like making a movie. You don't want the microphone to swing into the thing. <laughs> oh, that's a brilliant analogy. Yeah, I've not heard and, that. Yeah. And, and lose the lose the context or lose the lose the story. <clears throat> All of a sudden it's not about oh, you're snapped into reality again. You go, Oh, it's a trick. Yeah. You know, but if you can engage them in conversation and make it fun, then uh, then it's you know it's everything flows a little bit better. Um, it feels not so much a book of tricks, but more a series of lessons. Is that what you intended? Does that sound fair? Absolutely. I'm I'm glad you see it that way. I hope other people see it that way because, you know, I don't. You know, even if you don't want to learn these tricks, you know, the first chapter in the book uh, is how to read this book. And people are, I mean, a lot of people are just going to go right past that to the moves. But the idea behind reading the book is I don't care if you learn the Leon Haunted Dollhouse. I don't care if you learn the wand and the bottle. I don't care if you learn Ramsey's coins in the hat and the, my variations on it. Uh, but uh, read up to that point where you have to get real technical and if you don't want to learn it skip past that and read some more what i t- why i did this why i changed this w- what was my motivation for doing this i'm not i'm not trying to be creative for creativity's sake i'm usually trying to solve a problem this looks suspicious i don't have anything to say or what's the plot or what's the story behind this um so i try to use those tricks as examples to teach general principles that you could apply to things that you already do and i would challenge people i say this in my lectures all the time i say take something that you've been doing for years and and look at it again and go what's the problem and you ask most magicians what's the problem they go problem no problem i find the card people applaud you know the the ring appears on the end of the ring flight i let go of it and it it appears there you know it's like yeah but there's always problems you know the misdirection or what what looks suspicious if you were in the audience you know magicians think they're more observant they watch another magician they go oh he's uh he's hooking the ring on the ring flight there yeah it's yeah but i know that because i'm i'm a magician and i'm very knowledgeable no everybody's going what is he doing there yeah laymen are going what is he doing there they don't know exactly what he's doing but it's suspicious. That's something you have to deal with. So take things that you already do and try to improve them. And look for problems. Look for weaknesses. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, some people can be in magic for 50 years. And they go, I've been doing this trick for 50 years. And it looks like the same day that they learned it. It doesn't look any different. It hasn't improved from the day they learned it. And that is sad because, you know, magic, to me anyway, is, it's, a, it's a way of expressing myself and, and the discovery, uh, discovering ideas and discovering solutions to problems and uh, stories and presentations, all those things. That's what makes it fun to me, not just purchasing things or sure. get acquiring, acquiring secrets. You know, what are you going to do with them? You know, it's like designing things and getting a reaction out of people and say, I had something to do with this. I didn't just buy it. I didn't just know the secret and they didn't know. I designed this whole thing. I, you know, I worked it all out. That gives me a sense of pride as opposed to uh, I own this book. I own this video. I, I have this trick, this prop, Um, you know, so it's more fun for me. Do you think that constant tweaking and improving Because that's something, so I understand, that Ross did and Miller did and Vernon was curious until his his last breath. Do you think that's something that your mentors passed on to you or or was that inherent in you from the beginning? Uh, Well, I I definitely I saw that in their example, uh, but I also see it in the the example of musicians that I Mm. love and and painters that I love. Uh, I saw... Uh, I think it was a documentary on uh, Picasso and uh, he was in his one of his workshops and 
he was just walking around the studio and everything, and he was flipping through some canvases. And right on the front, I saw, I recognized one of the paintings, and I go, oh, I, I've seen that, I've seen that painting before. And he's flipping through it, and they're different versions of that painting. So he did this, and he goes, nah, color's wrong. <laughs> that, you know, this should be, the balance is wrong. Nah, this, that. And so that's the one that I saw, but all these others were going to be whitewashed over, and he's going to paint something on top of them. Uh. So you think, oh, well, Picasso's a genius. He doesn't have to work at it. No, that's crazy. All the musicians I love, all the writers I love, all the you know, all the magicians, magicians I love, painters, sculptors, movie makers. They make, they they try a lot of things. They think through things. And that's the creative part of it, not just acquiring things. What excites you about magic now? And what concerns you? <laughs> what excites me? Uh, I'm always looking for new premises. And, uh, you know, and a lot of times I'll look through old books and things just looking for a germ of an idea, not the, a routine that I'm going to necessarily learn, but... I've never thought of doing something with that prop or, oh, that's a, that's an interesting, uh, patter point that I could apply to something completely different. Um, uh, what concerns me really, I think consumerism is part of what concerns me that people think they can buy magic. That makes me insane because that's what, that's what most laymen think. They go, oh, you go to the magic shop mm -hmm. and you buy the thing. And, and you can do oh, the thing. You 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 bought it, and and I didn't. But if I bought it, I could do it. I bet I could do it, and that makes me insane because that lowers the status of magic in in the minds of the public because it's just totally easy and accessible, and and the violin is very easy to play badly. Anyone can play the violin badly. And, but the thing about magic is, if you find the card, the, people think you're a success, or you know, right. at least the magician thinks he's a success. He finished, he finished the trick. He found the card. But you know, all these other considerations, uh, you know, how smooth is it, or you know, it's a misdirection, is a good presentation. Uh, um, all these things matter uh, to me. So I guess what irks me is when people, when they when they don't think about when yeah. they don't think about their magic they don't uh, to a lot of them it's a it's a revelation that they even should think about it <laughs> you know not not even what to think but that they should think about it and i'm just i'm just saying it's more fun than paint by number magic yeah or turning a crank and music comes out yeah, yeah. the more you put invest of yourself and your your creative thought you know Everybody has a different talent and a different potential, you know, because <clears throat> uh, one guy might not be really commercial and another guy's super skillful mm -hmm. and another guy's super creative. I can't be Gate and Bloom. You know, it's <laughs> like, I, oh, my God, how could I possibly be Gate and Bloom? It's like, where do these ideas come from? You know, but maybe I can do a better pass than uh -huh. Gaten or... Or maybe I have a different approach to this kind of a trick, or you know, maybe he wouldn't touch that kind of a trick. Yeah, it's yeah. not interesting to him, you know. So everybody has some potential, and the tragedy is when people don't explore their potential, they'll never find it because they never look for it. They just think they just plug it in, plug and play. You sure. know, you don't really want that. Um, you are the envy of many having had the chance to ha hang out and learn from Fawcett and Charlie Miller and the professor but who are some magicians that you never got the chance to see perform that you would have loved to see perform oh boy well there a lot of them going far far back like sure. I'd, I'd love to see survey Leroy uh -huh. uh, the inventor of uh, uh, the Osra illusion which I think is the best illusion in magic it's it's just so simple uh, and, but such a strong effect, and, and uh, uh, Bautier de Colta mm -hmm. he invented so many things: the vanishing lady in the chair, the multiplying billiard balls, spring flowers, uh, Vatican birdcage, all kinds of things. I mean, the, you know. But again, he was not 
like he, he wasn't reported to be like a great entertainer, you know, but what a creative guy. Mm. And other people picked up his tricks. Alexander Herman and all the guys of the day were Keller stole his his uh, birdcage. It's like he found a relative that had a copy of the cage and he, he bought it from him and then they started reproducing them everywhere, you know. So, so uh, uh, let's see, who else? I don't know. I, I never got to see Ramsey. You know, I love Ramsey. I've seen him on film, but, you know, the, the, the cameras of the day, they had to wind them and you have 30 <laughs> seconds. So they're going really fast trying to get everything in. And, and if, by watching Galloway, I, I see the really slow approach that I imagine that a Ramsey would actually perform under. Um, but uh, uh, I've been lucky to see a lot of a lot of yeah. wonderful guys. And uh, but there's always somebody you can you know. There's still people today, young people today that do a lot of great, great stuff. And uh, and I you know I put myself in their place too because I say, well you know if it's not perfect or whatever, I go hey it took me a long time to learn this stuff. I didn't I wasn't. Uh, you know, I wasn't uh, a master of magic when I was a teenager or in my 20s or 30s. And, and I'm approaching that now just because I'm older. <laughs> just, maybe just as an honorary uh, degree. But, uh, but yeah, I have got a lot more experience. And uh, I have the benefit of, of talking to a lot of my friends and getting their opinions and, and um, their advice on yeah. things. You know, so. yeah. Obviously, apart from your new book, what are some books that you think any serious student of magic should have on their shelves? Uh, you'll be obviously all the Vernon books and, and uh, you know, maybe you don't need all the Ramsey books. If you get the Ramsey principles, the, you know, like the Ramsey legend, I think, or the Ramsey classics probably has, you know, the foundation mm -hmm. of Ramsey. Um, I love uh, the Tarbell course is like an, it's an, it's literally an encyclopedia. I was going to say almost like it is. It is an encyclopedia, <laughs> of like every principle in magic, every effect in magic, all kinds of different props. There's philosophy in there. There's advice. There's all kinds of things. I would never get rid of that because I'm constantly researching things and finding things in there that uh, I forgot were in there or didn't didn't or skipped over. Uh, I love uh, Martin Gardner's Encyclopedia mm -hmm. and Impromptu Magic because they're very terse. Uh, uh, explanations hold the coin here do this and it will appear as though this happens and you know that's it and maybe not even an illustration but you go wow what a great oh what a great gag or what a great oh I can add that to my handkerchief if I have a trick with a handkerchief I'll look up handkerchiefs and there'll be a bunch of gags or a bunch of little quick tricks with handkerchiefs so that lead into my color changing handkerchief or my whatever handkerchief or you know, and then I use the handkerchief with the cards. Right. So you know, building and uh, uh, building a uh, a routine uh, with other elements. Um, what other books? Uh, I mean, Tommy Wonder's philosophy is great. The books of wonder. Um, uh, I like the classics, uh, modern magic, and everything. It's really hard to read by today's standards you know it doesn't have a lot of illustrations but you read it for principles and you read it for premises and and um and i go back through them all the time looking for you know, what's that thing i remember something like that an illustration in there what, what was that thing you're familiar with it and then you can go back and get more details but you know it exists mm -hmm. so when you're trying to think of ideas you have something to go back and refer to and get the more more details sure sure there are there are so many questions and concerns that young magicians have as they come into magic nowadays what's one piece of advice that you'd give to a young magician right now uh slow down uh pause before and after every effect to get allow things to sink in and give people you know, a chance to react and uh, don't blend your moves and the presentation together What's because mean? this is not a presentation there's the coin now the coin is gone now the coin is here now the here now here that sets so all moves all moves and you're displaying moves instead say hey here's a coin now the funny thing about this what huh what i oh oh 
here it is. Anyway, what I was, what I, I don't know what the, you know. So you're pausing after each effect. It's not a ballet of the hands. So right. one move blends into the next and you keep going. It's about doing some magic and then de-emphasizing the moves down here. And that, but relating to people, relating to people, it's not all about your hands. And when you practice, I, I recommend that people spot check in a mirror. Don't practice with a mirror on a table and sit down and stare at your hands for three hours. Because that gets you used to staring at your hands, which makes other people stare at your hands. But it also doesn't make you consider you have to look up and look them in the eye and you have to relate to people and talk to people as you're as mm -hmm. you're doing things you don't you're not just staring into space you're always talking to people what what do you think of that and that's good misdirection when you say that and then you do the move and then you do this but if you're always doing this it's it's a which hand is it in yeah, yeah. that's all it is it's just a guessing game yeah so you know it's a it's a performance so you have to relate to people um, I guess that's that, that's what I would say. We are very, very nearly out of time, Mr. Carney. We end the show always with four quick fire questions. Are you oh. ready? Yes, I am. I'll show the book first. No, we'll I do the, the book, book after that. It, 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 it oh, is okay. Beautiful. Well, here it, it is. is again. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. And we will tell people okay. where they can get it immediately after your four quick fire questions. Are you ready? Anna. I'll watch for the orders here on the computer. Okay. All right. Oh, there another one just came in. Okay, good. All right. Favorite pizza topping? Oh dear, mm -hmm. uh, prosciutto. Okay. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, hard to say. Oh my God, so I many I wonderful know. movies. Oh my one. God, I've got one. John, one. Uh, 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 I just saw my favorite year again. I've, I watch all my favorite movies many times. My favorite year, very funny, heartwarming comedy. Favorite personal people that make music. Oh man, uh, Dylan, Elvis Costello, James Taylor, one. Joni Mitchell. Oh, I can't stop. There's no one. There's no one. That's ridiculous. There's no one. <laughs> and um, uh, finally, who would you rather fight? One massive Andy Gladwin or a hundred tiny Joshua Jays? Oh my God! Mm. Uh, Hard hitting well, questions, I have, John. I have I have mad nunchuck skills, so I could probably take care of the hundred uh, and humiliate the one. <laughs> okay, good deal. <laughs> now, due due to your your loathing of the commerciality of uh, magic, your book is not available through Murphy's and not available through magic stores. But after listening to this, I'm sure people are going to get it. So, how do they do such a thing? Ah, well, yeah, I've always handled stuff uh, myself because uh, early on I, I didn't make any money. I always give away the rights to things and, I, you know, I would never make any money on it. So I, I do everything through my site, site carneymagic.com. So here's the book. And uh, this, the, the, you know, people are just now getting copies because I, it took a long time to get them and then send them out. And now just this week the deluxe are going up because I had slip covers and everything. But, you know, it's, I spent a lot of time on the design of it and uh, making those photographs took forever <laughs> to get to look that crisp. You, they were not, those were not Polaroids or snapshots. <laughs> and so I try also try in the layout, that's uh, Ramsey's coins in the hat, a, like a, a new approach to that and a, a great finish for it. Uh, I tried to have, oh, there's uh, tributes to some of the people that I really admire in magic. There's Johnny Thompson and Mike Skinner and people like that. Um, uh, I don't know what I'm saying except buy the book. Carneymagic.com. I'll put a link yeah. into the show notes and on the blog post accompanying Great. this video. Great. John Carney, it's been my honor and an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. All the best.